Hi there, I'm Kim Fox, Managing Editor of Audience Development here at Philly.com, and I'm joined today by Investigations Editor Jim Neff and reporters Wendy Ruderman, Barbara Laker, and Dylan Purcell to discuss the latest in our Toxic City series, Tainted Soil. For those of you who haven't read it yet, you can visit philly.com slash tainted soil. To summarize the story quickly, this investigation focuses on the Philadelphia areas of Fishtown, Kensington, and Port Richmond, which show the problems with dangerous levels of lead left behind in the soil by smelters. Now booming construction is stirring it up and sending lead dust onto stoops, playgrounds, and parks. For the next 15 minutes or so, we're gonna to talk to the team and give viewers a look behind the investigation. So let's get started, Jim. You joined the Philadelphia Media Network, home to the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Daily News, and Philly.com a year ago. How did this investigation come about? Well, I inherited it. Um, the reporters had it framed up and had commenced the project. Um, I got involved and added uh, Dylan Purcell to do the data piece and uh, the sweeping of you know, court records and other public records, and we framed it up nicely and just con considered uh, it was the way to go, and we pushed on. Specific to this investigation, um, can you guys tell me a bit about what your day-to-day -day looked like, whether it was like in the newsroom or outside of the newsroom, just sharing with folks what your, what your path was? It was, it was really crazy. Well, we started the project at the end of November. We started for, for Toxic City um, Soil. We started that at the end of November, and we spent five months basically going out, knocking on doors, going door to door, asking people if we could test their soil, and the weather was changing, and it would go into Christmas, and it would be, it would be really, really cold or really, really rainy, and then it went into spring, and we would just... We were just out there every day for hours and hours and hours. And Barbara and I were laughing because there was so much construction going on that there were all these porta potties. So it was like for, for this kind of door to door journalism, we we were like, wow, this is great. Like, because you're out there all day long, you know, I would come home just either really sunburned or really cold or really tired, but just hours of being out talking. That was and, the amenity, the porta yeah. potty. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was like, so easy. Yeah, I know what it's really like. my door. I'm a resident of Fishtown. You knock on my door. What do you say to me? I open it up. You know, you're standing there. I'm looking at you like, what is happening? What do you do? Yeah, well, I have this thing where I've always done on every story where someone opens the door and the first thing I do is hold out my hands as soon as they open the door and say hi, I'm Barbara with the Inquirer Daily News. And they never shut the door on my hand. It's a really good trick. But anyway, <laughs> so once you introduce yourself and you just a kind of in a short sentence or a couple sentences, you we explained what we were doing there and that we were testing the soil in this area in the two zip codes we were in in Kensington, Fort Richmond and Fishtown. And the reason why we were doing it is because there were all these old former lead smelters in the area and we wanted to see if the soil, if lead was still in the soil. And so most, and then we had to get ourselves invited in, and this was the first project that Wendy and I have worked on where we had shovels and Ziploc bags wow. because we had to scoop up soil and put them in bags and label them. And we would call each other because we were working separately in the same area, and we'd say, oh, Wendy, like, I'm out of Ziploc bags. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I gotta get to the Wawa. <laughs> we would rendezvous <laughs> and trade equipment. But the thing with this, in the first two months, we went out with um, an environmental firm that uh, accompanied us, and they showed us how to collect soil samples and how to do dust wipes. And at one point, we went up to the lab in Ben Salem for this environmental firm, and they taught us how to, they instructed us on doing dust wipes. So it was really the first time, and then so after the two months went by, we started going out our, ourselves, and it, I felt like I was almost like a scientist. You know? Oh, yeah. It was just different, really and different. There were funny moments, too, like I was um, scooping up soil in a public park, and this woman came up to me and said, why are you collecting dog poop? <laughs> and so I had to explain what we were doing, and, and people got to know us in the neighborhood, like, that we were these two crazy people walking around with Ziploc bags and a, a shovel. No, it's very glamorous. People, yeah. people were really helpful. I mean, people yeah. were really helpful. Yeah. They would sort of tell us the history, or the, you know, they would give us a little bit of a, a you know, background, or they'd say, "Come on in." And some of them had they didn't know what to expect with the right. results. And well, Dylan helped a lot because he did. Um, he d got aerial shots of the neighborhood, so we could see he 
would could, would have been able to map out like which yards could have soil because some of these neighborhoods and some of the yards were concreted over and we needed people who had real dirt. You spend months and months working on something like this um, and you know I'll look to all of you but maybe to Jim. How do you decide when it's time to go public with the story? Well, we knew what our findings were as we were digging and as we were analyzing, as we were talking to people. So it kind of comes in place like a blueprint, you know, kind of a framing up of a house and the structure holds and now you've got it framed up and so you are down to decorating or painting it. So we've got it all painted up, it's roofed, and so, okay, well, what, what are we missing? So, oh, we need this kind of a voice. Well, it's in my notebook. Or, oh, good idea, let's make sure we get the developer voice uh, for this section. So, um, you know it, you know? I mean, you know it when you feel it, you know it when you see it. That's how it works for me. I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's kind a good of a good thing. thing. It's a good Dylan, what goes into the process, like let's get down to brass tacks, what goes into the process of actually testing the soil for lead levels and how did we arrive to that test or if you guys want to jump into because I'm getting a lot of questions like I, you know, obviously have been talking, you guys have been talking to folks on Facebook, I'm talking to folks on Facebook and not only do people, you know, and we'll get into this later, want to know what to do next, but they actually want to understand the process. Can you explain it to someone like me who is not very scientific. <laughs> I mean, I'll start off, but you know, uh, you know, in the beginning, we first went out with the with a, basically a piece of equipment that can take the sample right there, and we figured out that it was really slow. It was it was cold. The machine didn't cold. like it, um, and it gave us an immediate result. So we knew the score, you know, right then, or at least had an approximate score. But then we so we worked through this. We figured out, okay, that's not going to be good for next time. So the next time we went we went out. And now we knew we were going to take samples, but have them, you know, take it to the lab, and they would do what's actually a more precise test in the lab. Um, and then we did that for a while, but then um, we realized, well, we can actually cover more ground in a day if if these guys get trained and do it themselves. So it, it's kind of evolved. But all the samples went back to the same lab to get the same level of testing from, you know, a licensed firm that knows what they're doing. So that. We wanted that across the board. Yeah, we didn't analyze the soil. We, we left that to an environmental firm that specializes in that. And sometimes the samples would take a while to come back because they had they had this whole process where they would dry out the soil first. It had to be completely dry, and then they analyze it for heavy metals. And they can we we did start to look at arsenic levels, but we decided to stick with lead because it has the most impact on the developing brain. Yeah. So they and we specifically asked them to analyze it for for lead levels. Um, and it's, it, how they do it is, is Greek to me. I, I really can't, I wish we had like a scientist here to explain it, but so then they would give, generate a report and they, the levels would be done in parts per million. So anything above 400 parts per million of lead uh, in the soil is considered dangerous for, or hazardous for children to play in. Um, and so when we also, when we collected samples, it's important for people, people may want to know that we only took from bare soil, we didn't take, you know, a lot of times you go into a backyard and there are bare patches uh, in the grass. So we only scooped from there. We only did the first couple of layers, maybe an inch deep or two inches at the most, um, because we really weren't interested in that top layer that kids have access to. Mm -hmm. And then we stayed away from the house. Lots of houses are painted with lead. And so when it rains and the paint deteriorates, it drips down, it's called the drip line. So we stayed, we, we tried to take samples only away from the house. Okay. So in the middle of the backyard, at the back of the fence, but nothing that would skew our results to be coming from paint dripping off of the house, which is another way that lead gets in the soil. And visually, you can't see the difference between soil that's high in lead and soil that ha has virtually no lead. So it has to go through that lab. What are the negative effects of lead that families should be concerned about? Well, I mean, um, scientists are learning that at really, really low levels, and some scientists believe that the toxicity be begins as soon as the level in your blood gets above zero. Um, there's a whole debate about how, when toxicity starts, and as science evolves on it, the number is lower and lower and lower, and it impacts your ability. It can lower your IQ, it can cause impulsivity, ADHD, um, dep depression even, 
um, in children, headaches, temper tantrums. It just it's like a whole range, but mostly it's the cognitive developmental stuff and that you know impacts the developing brain. Um, and in fact, in doing this series, I have children, so I became, this is going to sound a little cray cray, but, um, <laughs> but I, I got so worried about my own children who are um, 11 and 13. I had not gotten them tested for lead that I recalled when they were one in age one and two, so I took their teeth, and their baby teeth, <laughs> and I paid for the lab myself to analyze the lead content in their bones because lead gets stored in your bones. So you can, I can actually know how much lead I've been exposed to if I have a baby tooth and I take it to be melted down. So I actually did this, Laura, I mean, um, uh, Barbara thought I was crazy, Dylan thought I was crazy, but I just needed to know, you know what I mean? Because at the time my son was um, having some trouble in school and I was just really, you know, I mean as a parent, you don't want your kid to have lead. Any level of lead is bad. Mm -hmm. So when you have kids, you understand that fully. You want your kid to have the best shot in life. What can people do to figure out whether or not their soil is toxic, whether it's here in Philadelphia or elsewhere in the United States? What steps can they take? Well, they can get their soil tested. In Philadelphia, they periodically have soil kitchens where people can take their soil to uh, like the University of Pennsylvania and get it tested. Um, so that's the first thing they can do because um, you can't tell by just looking at it. And so that's the first step. And then if it does come back higher than 400, there are steps people can take. Like they can remove some of the soil, put down all a, a top layer of new fill, clean fill. They can put sod down over it to cover it and cap it. Um, mulch the, the areas where you plant flowers. Um, for vegetables, they, people advise that they put them in raised beds with clean soil. Um, some people in this neighborhood have just put down concrete and some of the new um, houses in fact do not have any soil. They are all concreted over. Does the city, state or feds have any plans to address this issue? You know they really, well the, the, um, the EPA is planning to have um, as a public service to test, do like a uh, sort of like a fair where people can come, a health fair where people can, children can go and have their blood tested. And they'll also probably have a soil kitchen. They believe, a lot of people believe that just education is the best way to get the word out about it. Um, there has been some talk on the state level about whether you can use hazardous cleanup funds for individual backyards, whether that's possible. Um, I think um, that's one way to go. I know other cities like um, after Katrina in New Orleans, they brought in soil, fresh soil from other parts of the region to cover, you know, because all the houses got knocked down, there was so much lead paint in the soil that they trucked in fresh soil from other air, more, you know, rural areas of Louisiana and just did, we did some parks. Um, so, but I will say that the, the city health department does not see digging in soil um, and construction and digging as a, a, a source of childhood lead poisoning or as a real risk. The Commissioner Farley says that there may be some children here and there who have high blood lead levels from um, the soil, but he doesn't make that connection between digging into the soil and, and um, aerating it to be the source of, be a, be a, a real source, I guess, or a yeah, major, major source, major source, major source of uh, childhood lead poisoning. Uh, what was the biggest surprise during this investigation for maybe each of you? And I'm not, you know, not talking like, uh, you know, the basic day-to-day -day stuff, but just something that really, you know, when you tell the story in a bar or to friends and family, you know, that moment that, um, you know, you were shocked or surprised or... Well, when we went out with, we had this one day where we went out with an environmental uh, lab guy, and we went to this house. It was a beautifully landscaped house. It was a really nice backyard. And we were like, oh, this backyard's probably not going to test high. Um, it's so nice. And we, let's just take one scoop, kind of like to appease the homeowner who had asked us specifically to test her backyard. So we did do that. And we thought, you know, let's just do one. Because in other homes, we maybe did like five samples. So we felt like this was more of a courtesy. And then it came back at 
500 parts per million, which compared to our other scores really wasn't bad, wasn't that bad if you, if you put it in light of some of the 3,000 parts per million. So I went to her, her house to, to give her the news um, because a lot of, at first we tried to tell people in person, you know, we felt like we owed that to them. So we would circle back to their homes, knock on the door with the results. And when I told her, she was just devastated, really, really upset. She had an infant who hadn't yet started moving around, like four months old. Mm -hmm. And summer, you know, spring was approaching. So she asked me to retest. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna retest, but I'm really just gonna do it to put her mind at ease. Mm -hmm. And I went back, um, a couple months later, I took five samples from her backyard. And all of them came back higher than 500, but one of them came back almost 10,000 parts per million. Oh in God. a beautiful backyard, not it, wonderfully landscaped. Um, I, just, I just wasn't prepared for that. And here she was already upset about 500, and I just dreaded telling her. And, um, you know, it was just, it was hard. It was hard for her. It was really hard for her, and it was really hard for, for me um, as a reporter. I'd never had to give bad news like that to someone where, you know what I mean, where I, so it was just, yeah, it was, it was just a hard thing. That, and that, and then I guess it just surprised me because you just never know here. I just thought I was going to put her mind at ease with additional sampling. And in fact, I just, I almost felt bad about it. Well, I did feel bad about it because, you know, we, we have a grant to do this. So I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm blowing some of our grant money to ease this woman's mind. Do you know what I mean? And like, it ended up being a yeah, big part I mean, like, of the soul. You know yeah. what I mean? So you just know, I guess it just goes to show you, like you never know. And like Barbara said, um, you can't tell good soil from bad soil. You just, you have no idea. And you could look at a beautifully landscaped yard and think everything's fine. Or you could go to a yard that, you know, is, is neglected and think this is going to come up real hot. And then it won't. So. Are there any other moments? I think it was surprising to me that I envisioned smelters looking a certain way, like that you'd be able to see them with a smokestack and they would stand out to us. And they didn't. And they didn't to residents. So there was a woman who lived right behind a smelter, and it was a two-story smelter. You would not drive by it and think it looked like a smelter. It had no smokestack. She'd lived there more than 20 years, and she thought that it was a garage, because at one point it had been a garage. And one of her samples came back at um, almost like 4,500. Wow. And but to live like right smack dab next to a smelter and have no idea, I guess it shocked me and also her. And, um, and delivering the news to people when you, because a lot of our stories in other stories, we've spent a lot more time with people, um, talking to them and getting to know them. And with, these, with this, we did spend time with them, but not near as much time as we would on other stories because it, you know, it was about soil and so we didn't get their whole life story. And then you feel, um, you know, you feel bad when you're, when you're telling someone. How do you balance that as a journalist, the distance and the, you know, the relationship you're building with someone? How do you? It's really hard. I mean, there are, were some people in the, in the story who I obviously, and Wendy and Dylan got closer to mm -hmm. because um, the, their children actually did have lead poisoning. And so we spent, you know, more time with them and I got to know them. But it's, it's hard because you, have built a relationship with someone and then you have to, or don't don't really have much of a relationship and you have to kind of, you know, be very, just if you're human with someone and you genuinely care, I believe that people get that yeah. um, and they, they feel that and that's the best you can give people is that you genuinely care and that you educate them, that you tell them what you know and you get back to them and when they need help or they want numbers or people to call, that you provide that to them. Yeah, and we did have people, we were very mindful. We didn't want people to think that in exchange for testing your soil, you're going to be in the story. We, we never made people feel, it was important to us not to make yeah, them that they feel, feel pressure. Obligated. They, that they had no obligation and in fact one um, family uh, decided midway through the process that they didn't want to be in the story and we definitely took them out of the story. And, and I mean, we didn't want to violate people's privacy. I mean, we're talking about ordinary citizens, not politicians, you know, so we have a different, we handle them more gently. Yeah, and you make sensitively. sure you, you don't exploit people. Yeah. Because that's not a good thing and you don't want to do that. 
And so the people who are in the story, you want to make sure that they feel comfortable with it. Well, thank you all. We've gone way over because this has been super fascinating, and I think our audience is like glued as well. So I want to I want to thank all of you for joining us once again. I'm with investigations editor Jim Neff, reporters Wendy Ruderman and Barbara Laker, and Dylan Purcell. And uh, thanks for sharing your stories. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us.